welcome back to the final session of the day and we are on the way to complete neurology and only very minor topics are still left all right so if you can hear and see me you can tell yes probably so that we can start the session okay fine you can hear and see me cool so let us start with our uh, uh, discussion and once alzheimer is over the dementia becomes relatively simple because other types of dementia are relatively rare and uh, the second type of dementia we are going to discuss is on the frontotemporal dementia that is basically on something called as a frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder currently that's called ft mtd that's a frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder so how can i classify this frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder you can classify basically into two types uh, I mean, one is the behavioral variant and one is the speech variants. And of course, this frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder typically happens in relatively younger population. So Alzheimer's patients will have a relatively older age, but these patients are going to be relatively younger in their nature. Clear? So that's how they're going to be. And more importantly, uh, they're going to affect the frontal and the temporal lobes. With the relative sparing of the parietal lobes, they're going to typically affect the frontal and the temporal lobes only they don't affect the parietal lobes that much so that's also very important to understand so in that i can tell you what are the problems that the patient is going to have because of involvement in the frontal lobe and i can also tell what are the problems that these patients are going to have because of the relative impairment of the temporal lobe remember apart from alzheimer disease which typically affects memory other F other uh, neurocognitive disorders will not have memory loss as a major finding, even though they do can have memory loss, but memory loss is not a very, very important feature as far as the other uh, neurocognitive disorders are concerned. Even in frontotemporal dementia or frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder, memory loss is not going to be the prominent finding in this setting. So as far as the frontal lobe is concerned, the problem is going to be more in the executive dysfunction. I'll tell you what you mean by executive dysfunction sometime. Apart from that, they'll have a lot of behavioral issues like apathy, then uh, disinhibitory behavior because frontal lobe is affected. So behavioral issues will be there. I think I told you the prefrontal cortex is the seat of inhibition, social behavior. So if it's lost, they can result in disinhibition or sometimes you can go for apathy and poor thinking and all this stuff. The temporal lobe is affected. There are two things that temporal lobe uh, will be involved with. One is the language, we know that. And second one is going to be the your memory. Even though memory impairment is not very prominent in front temple dementia, still it can happen. And as far as the language is concerned, there are many different types are there. Like we have non-fluent aphasia variant, which will mimic a little bit of Broca's-like picture. And you can have a semantic or a fluent aphasia variant. Semantic or fluent aphasia-like variant. So this will mimic, a, I mean, something like Wernicke's, not all the features, but something like Wernicke's will be there. So these are basically the different types. So based on the two lobes involvement, frontal and temporal lobe, uh, you can have uh, uh, this kind of uh, issues. And remember, more importantly, even if the temporal lobe is affected, the most common area in the temporal lobe that is affected the anterior temporal lobe, not the medial temporal lobe. And there will be relative sparing of the medial temporal lobe because uh, temporal lobe involvement, that medial temporal lobe involvement is very classical of a Alzheimer disease, the first site to involve in Alzheimer disease. But in frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder, the anterior temporal lobe is the one that is going to be very commonly involved compared to the, of the uh, medial part of the temporal lobe. Okay. Then uh, we also have the different types, as I told you, uh, based on which area is predominantly involved, whether it's the frontal lobe or it's the temporal lobe, which is predominantly involved. Based on that, we can give different types of uh, frontotemporal dementia. In that, I'm going to start with something called a behavioral variant. So I'll put three variants here. I mean, two variants here. One is the behavioral variant. And this is supposed to be the most common variant of frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder. That's called a behavioral variant. And then we have the speech variants also, or we can call it as language variants or speech variants. If they ask you an exam, what is the variant that is extremely common in frontotemporal dementia? I'll be answering behavioral variant only. Language variants are comparatively less common. So here the predominant problem, as I told you, will be in the frontal lobes. Frontal will be the predominant problem. Here, most of the problems will be located in the temporal lobe only. But remember in the anterior temporal lobe, not in the medial temporal lobe. As far as the 
behavioral variants are concerned so the most important problem will be disinhibition in this patients disinhibition in the sense we know uh, it might translate into a kind of an antisocial behavior also but uh, disinhibition very important like uh, a impulsive behavior and uh, very inappropriate behavior like an example i told you if i go to pee in the screen and come back and sit and take the class so that's an inappropriate behavior so this is what we mean by antisocial behavior or disinhibitory behavior and they can have severe apathy and uh, abulia abulia means difficulty initiating a thought so an extreme form is what we refer to as apathy and uh, they will also have loss of sympathy in the sense like they won't have any kind of sympathy and that can also translate to a disinhibitory or antisocial behavior sympathy empathy will be lost once again it's an important function of a prefrontal cortex and uh, number 4 is they can result in development of something called a hyper orality like for example a binge eating increased consumption of uh, socially unacceptable products like alcohol cigarettes and all this stuff and even this can start in uh, eating mud which is called as pica so that's possible so that will come under hyper orality and uh, because of that you will encounter a lot of dietary changes in this patient so this will be the clue in exam so this kind of disinhibited behavior hyperlactate dietary changes eating uh, i mean nonsense stuff so this is what is going to be the classical features of behavioral variant as far as the language variant is concerned uh, we call them as progressive primary aphasia and the most important area that will be affected in uh, language variants is the temporal lobe that's where the involvement is going to be so as i told you you are going to have three different uh, types in this one is called a non fluent aphasia uh, otherwise referred to as a progressive non fluent aphasia also referred to as a agrammatic type of aphasia so where predominantly it will mimic like a broca kind of a picture where uh, they'll find problems in speech output the fluency will be lost and uh, they can uh, of course they will have naming issues anomia will be there and uh, they might have this word finding difficulties in fact like when they want to tell something they'll not be able to tell so they don't they will search for that word what word should come come at that point so they cannot get that word properly word finding difficulties we all get in viva voices isn't it so this kind of word finding difficulties are very common in the setting of a non fluent aphasia so you can imagine a person who is going to answer i may be a boy who is answering a viva voice is going to behave like a non fluent aphasia word finding difficulties and uh, poor articulation difficult speech labored speaking as if they are trying to speak in a very tough manner you know like it becomes very incredibly tough for them to speak so it's called labored speech and naming difficulties typically a boy who is presenting to a viva voice and uh, what about this other variant that's called a fluent aphasia always referred to as a semantic variant fluent aphasia and semantic variant this will be like for example a girl who's going to viva voice you can imagine like that where the girl is use is going to use uh, words like thing stuff so you know like there will be too much you know like it look like as if they are having a normal fluency but they tend to manipulate in between they tell lot of wrong things but since the examiner is more concerning on the girl than what she is trying to say they try to say a lot of stuff and examiner is the one who gives most of the times this kind of uh, boost to the girls isn't it so they will tell ah come on come on ma yes what you are telling is right so the girl becomes too much happy and she starts telling you know, like this kind of stuff which is not even in the textbooks so that's basically like kind of a semantic variant or a fluent variant where there will be comprehension problems typically to an extent like wernicke's but not exactly wernicke's comprehension difficulties will be there and uh, but intact repetition for example if examiner tells something you tell the same thing again so repetition may be there and again again they'll be doing lot of repetition in between and uh, many generalization also can be there like for example they will use uh, a word called thing very common instead that's an example so where they don't use the exact word for example if i use pencil or pen this is an exact word for this but if it's this thing i'm going to write and uh, i'm going to write on this particular thing so this kind of generalization will be there for example if you show an uh, dog photo and if you ask what is this they'll be telling uh, animal not a dog i mean you have to tell it's a dog but they will tell it's animal so this kind of generalization will be there this is again very classical not classical of wernicke's but still can happen in setting of a uh, frontotemporal dementia especially the fluent and the semantic variant third variant which is coming up now right now is the logopenic variant 
logopenic progressive aphasia here the main problem will be repetition difficulties and uh, naming difficulties so non fluent output will be the main problem okay this is the most important problem in uh, non fluent aphasia and uh, as far as semantic variant is concerned the comprehension will be the most important problem and most importantly the generalization as i told you that's going to be the key here for diagnosis and at the same time as far as logopenic variant is concerned the repetition loss repetition will be the most important problem here it will be lost and all these three are going to have naming difficulties naming difficulties will be there in all these three things so repetition will be lost here that's the primary problem comprehension and generalization comprehension loss and generalization is the primary problem here and output articulation very labored speech that's a characteristic feature of a non fluent aphasia nevertheless in exam how will you make out this frontal temporal dementia a young patient around probably 50 55 years so a young patient uh, coming with more of a word finding difficulty language issue think about a frontal temporal neurocognitive disorder or if a young patient coming with more of a behavioral issues to start with so think of a uh, frontal temporal neurocognitive disorder remember amnesia happens late in the setting of a frontal temporal neurocognitive disorder and at the same time memory is relatively spared in the setting of a so sorry, sorry not memory i'm talking about uh, other domains like calculation and all these things are relatively spared for example even drawing is relatively spared in the setting of a frontal temporal neurocognitive disorder because calculation drawing are all functions of the parietal lobe not the functions of the frontal lobe so that's why they are spared and as far as the investigations are concerned um typical diagnosis through brain brain biopsy only but that is completely unnecessary so you are going to diagnose clinically only but there are some genes that are affected i mean which, which we didn't discuss so a gene called tdp53 gene is there t has or tdp43 gene is there that's called a tard bp gene t a r d b p but simply you can remember as tdp43 gene then you have a gene called pro guanel gene that is involved probably involved in uh, frontal temporal dementia then you have mapt gene this is for tau protein this for the develop production of tau protein so mapt gene can be involved and we have another gene called vcp gene so these are the usual genes that are involved in the development of frontal temporal neurocognitive disorder as far as the investigations are concerned i can do imaging as i told you before to rule out other causes then spec can be done where i will see hypoperfusion in the frontal lobes and the temporal lobe but in the temporal lobe anterior part of the temporal lobe is the one that is going to be mostly affected in setting of a frontal temporal neurotic neurocognitive disorder suppose if you do a biopsy the most important point is you will not see nfts you will not see a beta amyloid blocks which clearly tells you that it is not alzheimer disease but on the other hand you might see some tau inclusions remember these are not hyperphosphorylated tau protein so that should not be called as nfts and the morphology will not be similar to that of nfts but these tau inclusions that you see here are referred to as pig bodies because they don't look like nfts and uh, and at the same time uh, they are not due to hyperphosphorylated tau proteins so these are called as by a separate name called as pig bodies and you can develop and you can see this inclusion bodies in the form of tdp43 inclusion bodies so these are two inclusion bodies to generally see in the develop in the setting of a frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder remember it is the fourth most common cause of dementia uh, not the first most common first most common is always alzheimer disease and it's the most common cause of dementia in younger patients less than 65 years of age after 65 of course alzheimer is going to the most common that's why i told you relatively younger 50s and 55s most common cause of dementia in younger patients less than 65 years and treatment you are going to use the same treatment as that of what you use for alzheimer disease even though the response is very limited you don't get a good response in the setting of a frontal temporal neurocognitive disorder then we have dementia with levy bodies currently we'll called as ncd with levy bodies neurocognitive disorder with levy bodies or dementia with levy bodies and remember even though it's called as dementia with levy bodies or ncd with levy bodies levy bodies are seen only in 30 to 35 percentage of the individuals it's not seen in all the individuals what are the characteristic features remember once again memory loss will not be a major problem here in fact memory will be spared 
in uh, NCD with Levy bodies. Most of our patients will have a, a very good memory, in fact, but other cognitive domains will be affected. For example, attention will be the most important problem in this. And second is executive function. Attention and executive function are the two things that will be severely impaired in the setting of NCD with Levy bodies. And second thing, the most important clue is visual hallucinations and there'll be complex and formed visual hallucinations most of the time so this is the reason why these patients can be mistaken as psychosis also because it's not a psychosis because psychosis insight will be impaired but uh, this is a ncd only so insight may be still there so that differentiates it from a psychosis but this visual hallucination is the very important keyword for diagnosing uh, ncd with levy bodies in the exams and of course, some at least one of the Parkinson features will be there. At least one of the Parkinson's clinical features will be there. You know what are the Parkinson's features? You have tremors, akinesia, rigidity, and uh, you have postural dysfunction. So we'll be discussing about in some time. So one of the Parkinson disease uh, features will be there, like bradykinesia, tremors, or rigidity. At least one Parkinson feature will be there. And number four, they can have REM sleep behavioral disorder. REM sleep behavioral disorder. This is very characteristic of Levy bodies, in fact. It can happen even in Parkinson disease because even Parkinson, some of the cases are due to Levy body formation. So there is some association with Parkinson anyways. That's why this lemon, some patients with the Levy body dementia also has associated Parkinson features. So one of the important features of this Levy bodies is the REM sleep behavioral disorder, which can happen in Parkinson also. I'll be telling that that time as well. And Levy bodies are aggregates of alpha synuclein. We know that. And these are also intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. And they're eosinophilic in nature. Intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusion bodies. Remember, A beta amyloid plaques are eosinophilic, whereas neurofibrillary tangles are basophilic. Alpha synuclein, that is uh, Levy body formation, is again intracytoplasmic and eosinophilic inclusion bodies. And number five, apart from this, they have extreme sensitivity to neuroleptics. That's a very important word. Extreme sensitivity to neuroleptics. Why? Because already they have Parkinson features. And top of that, if you give a neuroleptic drug like haloperidol, it's an antipsychotic. Dopamine blockers are what we call as neuroleptics. They will significantly worsen the Parkinson feature, and the patient is going to suffer a lot. And the patient may be frozen completely, and the rigidity tremors and bradykinesia will worsen a lot. And that's why it's called as extreme sensitivity to neuroleptics. And they may even progress to a stage where they can develop a neuroleptic malignant syndrome also. And that's very dangerous. So that's why you should try avoid using this neuroleptics in this. And why we commonly use neuroleptics is because many times as a beginner, some psychiatrists may diagnose this as a psychosis because they have visual hallucinations. For that, they might start haloperidol and that results in a catastrophe because patients will uh, start developing severe Parkinson features after giving. So that's what you call as uh, extreme sensitivity to neuroleptics. And treatment as such, see that's the sixth point, you're going to give rivastigmine. Rivastigmine is one of the best treatment. In fact, any acetylcholinesterase inhibitor works, central ACH inhibitor works, like what we use for uh, Alzheimer's disease, but rivastigmine has the best response among all. In fact, rivastigmine works better than your uh, Alzheimer's disease here. So that's a very good treatment, very good therapy for dementia with Levy body, sensitive with Levy body. So the exam clue will be mostly the visual hallucinations. Any patients with NCD and visual hallucinations, think about Levy body dementia. Remember here, memory is spared. In the sense like there'll be no problem in the memory at all. That's why I told you, apart from the Alzheimer's disease, most of the other cognitive dysfunctions will have uh, a, re re a reasonably spared memory or you can have even a normal memory most of the times. So then next one is the vascular dementia or otherwise it is vascular neurocognitive disorders. Typically it is due to vascular events like a large stroke due to a large vessel infarction or it could be due to multiple lacunar infarcts that is happening again and again. Multiple lacunar infarcts that's happening again and again. So anything that can uh, result in damage to the basal forebrain. So that is going to result in a vascular neurocognitive disorder previously called as vascular dementia. So the key features of vascular dementia in exam is this typical step ladder pattern of deterioration. 
uh, that's what is suggested but remember there can be a slowly progressive decline in fact this is supposed to be the most common but the step ladder pattern of deterioration is what is very commonly asked in exam and very characteristic feature of a vascular neurocognitive disorder so that's why this is being thought to be very important but on the other hand currently it's believed that this progressive deterioration is the most common entity as far as vascular neurocognitive disorder is concerned and of course it's going to be stroke due to stroke so how will you differentiate this from a other dementia remember any neurocognitive disorder with typical yeoman signs with early onset yeoman signs typical and early yeoman signs is equal to vascular dementia or vascular neurocognitive disorder vascular ncd so anyone with yeoman signs typical yeoman signs xrd drs babinski positive in exam you can always think about a vascular entity so when you think think about the step ladder pattern yeoman signs and a dementia remember in alzheimer disease to get a motor problem it takes a very long time but in vascular dementia you get yeoman signs much much faster early at the time of presentation itself they will have significant yeoman signs that's a important feature of a vascular dementia treatment wise uh you can use anti dementia drugs which i have told you before but it's not going to work that much but nevertheless you can give and at the same time you have to prevent subsequent stroke because at every vascular event they deteriorate further and further and further that's why that classical step ladder pattern of deterioration is there so to prevent the further strokes by giving proper secondary prophylaxis to these individuals and uh risk modification i told you know just now so at every event they have this step ladder pattern of deterioration they will be stable over a long period of time then again they will uh, get worse in their cognitive performance then again after some time they will worsen they will be stable for some time and again they will worsen this uh, uh cognitive domain fu function testing so that's how you diagnose a step ladder pattern of deterioration and that's classical of a vascular type of uh, neurocognitive dysfunction so we are all these things fine and i mean we didn't discuss about the infectious form of uh, neurocognitive disorder that is creutzfeldt jakob disease this is a very important cause of dementia there are many types of creutzfeldt jakob disease like sporadic creutzfeldt jakob disease variant creutzfeldt jakob disease many different types are existing but sporadic is the most common almost 85 percentage of the creutzfeldt jakob disease will be sporadic in nature first of all you need to know the age in sporadic age will be usually more than 50 and uh, only two points that you need to know one is rpd that is rapidly progressing dementia move down okay one is rpd that is rapidly progressing dementia rapidly progressing dementia in the sense uh, you will have dementia within 6 months all the uh, domains of cognition will be affected within a period of 6 months so this is what we refer to as something called a rapidly progressing dementia in this setting um plus the patients will have motor problems like myoclonus even though they can have lot of behavioral issues but whenever these two things are present in exam rapidly progressing dementia with myoclonus that is equal to creutzfeldt jakob disease unless proved otherwise that's all that is creutzfeldt jakob disease as simple as that and this is the clue and of course investigation wise the best investigation is brain biopsy only that's the gold standard to find out this prion bodies but we don't anyway do that investigations instead we try to diagnose based on mri in mri you see two classical signs one is called cortical ribboning and second one is called a hockey stick sign hockey stick sign and third one is called the pulvinar sign so all these signs have been asked in exams hockey stick sign pulvinar sign cortical ribboning all these are classic findings in mri cortical ribboning is very commonly seen in scjd and uh, hockey stick sign and pulvinar sign is commonly seen in vcjd variant cjd but nevertheless all these are important for exams and if you do an eeg again very classic in a sporadic creutzfeldt jakob disease like you can see this kind of slow background the entire background will be slowed but there will be periodic sharp waves here and there there will be periodic sharp waves this is very classical of a uh sporadic creutzfeldt jakob disease again in variant creutzfeldt jakob disease you cannot predict what you will see but in a sporadic creutzfeldt jakob disease this is the classic finding that you will see and as far as csf is concerned there is one protein that is very important that's called a 1433 this doesn't have any special name that will be increased so 
that's a many times asked question 1433 increase remember this is a non specific protein but it becomes specific at certain entities because it's a kind of a neural injury con uh, sort of a protein which means any neural injury can cause elevations of this 1433 so if you have ruled out any acute causes like infarcts trauma bleeding if you rule out all these things so if you don't have any background issues still if 1433 is elevated then that time it can become a little specific for crutzfeld jacob disease apart from that it's found to be a marker of a severe neural injury that's all so eeg is over and as far as the treatment is concerned there is no treatment you don't have any treatment for crutzfeld jacob disease invariably the patient is going to die and the median survival in the setting of sporadic crutzfeld jacob disease is only 8 months irrespective of whatever treatment you give they are going to die within 8 months variant cjd very very rare disease it's not common only 5 percentage can have variant cjd and usually age will be less than 30 to 35 very young age so variant cjd apart from that many things can overlap with variant cjd but more often they'll come with a behavioral issue and uh, it's a very rare disease so no need to bother much about it so usually in exam your uh, scjd will be the question and you know what's going to happen in the setting of a uh, crutzfeld jacob disease it's a prions disease so normally you know prions are in the form of, i mean the form of pr pc configuration which is an alpha helix configuration this is a normal prion protein and uh, we really don't know what is the function of a normal prion protein but still it's present in all the cells but this normal prion protein due to some reason it becomes something called prp sc that's called a scrapey form sc stands for scrapey here so once they become this prpsc form they get arranged themselves in beta pleated sheets and what they do is i mean they i mean how much ever times they ask this prpsc is just a protein that's all but this is one of the medical enigmas how this protein is able to infect other proteins in the sense like this protein once they form they cause conversion of this prpsc to prpsc once again more prpsc this will again act on the prpsc to produce more prpsc psc so this is looking like some sort of a virus and a cloning isn't it so the same pr once pr psc protein is formed so they keep you know like this kind of vicious cycle and they convert more and more pr psc to pr psc which means it's like a protein infecting another protein that's very enigmatous and it's looking like a virus but it's not it's a protein only how many ever times they ask in exam i can show little it's a protein only it's definitely not a virus it behaves like a virus though that's one enigmatous thing about this prion protein fine so this is about uh, cjd as far as cjd is concerned rapidly progressing dementia with myoclonus is equal to cjd unless proved otherwise that's all fine so i think we have discussed about almost all the dementias as of now but now let us summarize because it will be very tough otherwise to diagnose in exam so first is uh, alzheimer disease what will be the clinical features of alzheimer disease usually the most important thing is the slow progression age more than 65 years and uh, predominant memory defects amnesia is the most important problem plus or minus behavioral issues later on but this is going to be the most important and um, you will see ex vacuo kind of an hydrocephalus in mri otherwise completely normal imaging or spect may show reduced perfusion in the temporal lobes temporal lobes and probably parietal lobes especially in the temporal lobes in the medial temporal lobes and pet that uh, i told you know pittsburg compound b pab so that could be a future but still only the name is important right now treatment is acylcholinesterase inhibitors like i mean uh, donapezil or galantamin and you are going to use nmd receptor agonists like memantin this is going to the treatment as far as your frontotemporal neurocognitive dis disorder is concerned patient is going to be less than 65 years relatively young in exam and predominantly behavioral issues like antisocial behavior and all this stuff and they'll have language problems language issues but memory is not a very important problem here so in this setting investigation wise you can do spect where you can see decrease perfusion but this time it's in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobes and uh, typically in the anterior temporal lobe not in the medial temporal lobe and treatment we don't know same treatment you can try but it doesn't work generally and inclusion bodies anything i can write here separately is there any this is the treatment this is the clinical feature and this is the investigation 
as far as inclusion bodies is concerned alzheimer disease a beta amyloid and neurofibrillary tangles which are nothing but hyperphosphatated tau proteins and inclusion bodies here you can see pig bodies and you can see tdp43 and you can see fus there is another inclusion body i, I forgot to tell that is fus is also there pig bodies are basically tau inclusion bodies only and you have a dementia with levy bodies i can write dlb or you can write as D, i mean uh, Le i mean ncd associated levy bodies age can be anything but the most important clue will be visual hallucinations parkinson features and patients having attention deficit predominant problem will be attention deficit and executive dysfunction so in that setting you are going to diagnose uh, levy body dementia the treatment is acetylcholine inhibitor acetylcholine stress inhibitors and rivastigmine especially in that group that's going to be very important investigation wise you don't have much investigations to do here and uh, as far as inclusion bodies are concerned you are going to see levy bodies levy bodies it's alpha synuclein bodies vascular dementia or vascular neurocognitive disorder will be typically having uh, human signs in a patient who is having cognitive dysfunction prominent human signs and the characteristic step ladder pattern of deterioration mri is very 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 important here where you want to find out the infarcts either a big infarct or a multiple lacunar infarct especially involving the basal forebrain area so that's a sign here and again here memory loss will not be a problem the main problem will be attention and executive dysfunction that's going to be the most important problem and treatment wise uh, you can try drugs but prevent further strokes prevent further strokes by giving a good secondary prevention like clopidogrel aspirin and all this stuff and possibly no inclusion bodies here and finally you have a cjd the clue will be rapidly progressing dementia plus myoclonus so if you see these two in exam it's always crutzfeld jacob disease at any cost investigation wise you can see mri where you know you are going to what are going to get that kind of signs we discussed already cortical ribboning pulvinar sign hockey stick sign you can have csf1433 or eeg you can see that uh, sharp waves slow background the periodic sharp waves so characteristic again of uh, crutzfeld jacob disease and treatment i mean treatment wise you don't have any treatment uh you know like as far as the biopsy is concerned you can see this spongy form changes that's why the original name for crutzfeld jacob disease is spongy form encephalopathy and uh, it's due to cow i mean eating cows that is called a bovine spongy form encephalopathy bsc so these are the five important dementias or five important neurocognitive disorders that you need to know for exams this final table what i have given will be very useful for you in exam before going for uh exams the revision purpose this table will be very useful so you just go through this table and go clear do you understand so that we can move on to the next one clear right actually to be honest i always feel that neurocognitive disorders are very difficult to explain to a student because they have not seen as simple as that that's the one reason plus it's like a kind of an implicit memory it's non declarative it's very difficult to explain what you really see in the patient but nevertheless i've tried to make it make it as simple as possible and the final table is very important uh, just read that and go for exams and apart from that uh, what else is there yeah uh, we have meningitis we can discuss on that aspect meningitis or probably meningo encephalitis very important and uh, of course the usual reason for development of meningo most common organism if they ask you of course it's going to be uh, pneumococcus only streptococcus pneumonia that's also the rationale for vaccinating with pneumococcal vaccine almost all the people because they are prone for meningococcal meningitis and there are many different strains are also there which are not going to discuss right now And apart from that if they ask you where uh, you will develop meningococcal infection 
Meningococcal infection is very common in adolescents, especially when they move to the dormitories and hostels. Uh, especially in exam, if you get a student, school student who has completed the schooling and went to a different area to a hostel for accommodation, that moment. So during that time, if you get a meningitis, very commonly it will be a meningococcal infection. So meningococcus, this adolescents, teens who are moving out of the house and going to a hostel. So that is the time where you get a meningococcal infection. Apart from that, most of the adult patients will be having meningitis most commonly due to pneumococcal infection, that is streptococcus pneumonia. Nevertheless, you can get staphylococcal meningitis also. Like uh, when you suspect staphylococcus pseudomonasonal, when there is a procedure that's being done. For example, if it's a, a ventriculoperitoneal shunt or you've done some craniotomy, some any neurological surgery, and after that, if you get a meningitis or a meningoencephalitis, that is likely to be staph or pseudomonas, hospital acquired. So probably. Apart from that, organism-wise, uh, listeria is very important. Listeria. Listeria is the most common cause of rhombin cephalitis in the world till now. So they cause a peculiar entity called rhombin cephalitis. And uh, listeria can be suspected in extremes of age. For example, extremely younger age, like infant or you know, like newborn child, or you can think about in very old age, like more than 65 years, 70 years. Extremes of age, you can think about listeria. But in general, we give listerial prophylaxis after 50 years of age, or if patient is HIV or some other immunosuppression is there, you can think about listeria. Then there is another organism you can think about that is uh, nocardia. Typically in post-transplant setting, you can think about nocardia also, even though other organisms are common. But in exam, notoriously, if the examiner gives uh, a kind of a brain abscess that is not responding to your routine antibiotics, then in that setting, you can go for a nocardia as the answer. So. As far as the organisms are concerned, most of the adults, it will be pneumococcus. As I told you, these teens and uh, these young adults who are moving out of the home into some new hostel, that time you can suspect meningococcus. Then uh, if it's a post neurosurgery, then you can suspect staphylococcus, corns or staph aureus or you can suspect a pseudomonas in this setting. Or if the patient is having uh, extremes of age, especially elderly, extremes of age, especially age more than 50, or immunosuppressed, like HIV. In this setting, you can think about a uh, listeria, listerial meningitis. Remember, listeria is the most common cause of rhombin cephalitis in the world. And at the same time, post-transplant. In exams, think about nocardia. I'm not telling always nocardia. I have to think about common organisms also. Plus, along with that, you can think about nocardia if they are not responding to common antibiotics. Because nocardia is acid first. We know that. So uh, notoriously, an examiner might give the CSF may show some acid first organisms also. In that, don't think about TB if it's a post-transplant. You can think about nocardia. That's very important as well. Uh, so these are the usual reasons for meningitis. Remember, meningitis will not have a typical phocological deficit, no FND. If it's only a meningitis, you should not get FNDs, and they'll be having very minimal cortical symptoms and signs. Cognitive dysfunction will not be that severe in the setting of a meningitis. Suppose if you have an encephalitis, in this setting, you will have an associated phocological deficit like cranial palsies and all this stuff. And uh, there will be severe cognitive dysfunction. There will be more cortical symptoms and signs. More and more cortical symptoms and signs. And uh, for presence of phocological deficit usually goes towards a menin encephalitis. So which means in, in the setting of meningitis and you have an encephalitis also, that's called meningoencephalitis. Clinically, it's very difficult to diagnose them, but you need other imaging techniques also. And apart from that, if you think about a virus, there are many, many viruses that can cause encephalitis and meningitis. But if you think about a virus, always think about herpes simplex virus. That's the most common virus that uh, that is a known cause of uh, viral encephalitis. Most common, uh, you know, like identifiable cause of viral encephalitis is herpes simplex encephalitis. 
And whenever a patient is suffering from HIV, you have a variety of causes. Like it can be due to listeria. Listeria can cause rhombencephalitis, or uh, infection can be from uh, cryptococcus meningitis. Cryptococcal infection is there. So that is also one possibility in this setting. So you have to think about cryptococcal meningitis as well. So many, many infections are there, but this is what we commonly think. Even TB can be there, but you know, like where we diagnose TB, I'll tell you in some time. So fine. So we have known some of the few organisms that can cause meningitis. Now, how to evaluate a patient with meningitis? So first, uh, mainly suspect when a patient is coming with fever, headache, altered mental status, then um, if the patient is having neck stiffness, the patient is having focological deficit, cortical symptoms and signs, these are said so you cannot write, so or the patient is having photophobia. So common feature will be fever and a headache. So this will be a common feature, other things are plus or minus sort of a thing. So usual will be fever and headache, that's going to be most important. In this setting, I'm going to definitely suspect a meningitis or probably even a meningoencephalitis. I'm going to suspect. Once I suspect, uh, next, uh, see the patient is uh, having for FND or not. Just hold on, I'll come back. <clears throat> 